Father, we thank you for the grace that has called us to your side. We thank you for the love that has planned for our salvation. We thank you for the blood that has bought us and washed us and cleansed us. Father, we are praying that in our attitude to you, relationship to you, we will show gratitude in everything that we do in Jesus' name. Lord, we are asking that as we are here today, together gathered today, that your blessings will fall mightily upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Lead us on now in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has given us this opportunity this month to consider the secrets of spiritual growth, spiritual power, spiritual progress. And last Sunday I spoke to you from the Word of God on preparation for spiritual growth. And I told you that it's necessary that we have strong desires, great ambition, spiritual aspiration. If we're going to grow, have the desire to grow. Because it doesn't come on us naturally, automatically as ripe fruits from the tree. We have to show that we really want something, we desire something. And that thing we desire, if it is spiritual growth, God is willing and He has planned to bless us in a spiritual way. But then I told you that the dead, those who are dead spiritually, they will not have a desire like that. And those who are backsliding, they will be satisfied with their own ways. But if we have been born again, lives changed, sins forgiven, hope anchored in Christ, name written in heaven, with the witness of the Spirit of God with our spirits that we are children of God, I'm sure that if that life is within you, you'll find that there is a desire within you. You are longing, you are desirous, you are thirsty, you are hungry after the things of God. You say, I've got something, but I want more. I want the Lord himself to take me to a higher realm, higher level. And your son will be every time. Lord, take me to higher ground. Now, when we talk of growth, spiritual growth, spiritual progress, whenever we're talking on reaching higher ground spiritually, actually we're talking of making some spiritual movement. That means going from the level in which you are now, spiritually, to a higher level. You have listened to the angel beckoning unto John, saying, come up higher. And there is something that is planted within you, saying, that's just the desire of my heart. Isaiah spoke about it in a passage I'll be reading to you from Isaiah chapter 35. Jesus spoke about it in a passage I'll be reading to you from Matthew chapter 7. And Paul talked about it in Ephesians, saying we should walk in the Spirit. As they all combine together in the uniformity of the, of the message, they're saying that we're on a pilgrimage. We're taking a journey. And our destination is heaven. The very presence of God. Whatever religious privileges we've got, whatever religious positions we have attained, and whatever religious activities we might have involved ourselves in, if we lose sight of our goal of living with God eternally, of making heaven our eternal home, then we become foolish. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for the redeemed. And it must be your aim. It must be your desire. It must be your ambition and your decision that you are going to be prepared and ready when he comes. Now turn with me to Isaiah chapter 35 from verse 8. And an highway shall be there. And a way 
and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Isaiah called it the highway of holiness. And as we prepare for spiritual growth, as we learn the secrets of spiritual power, spiritual progress, spiritual growth, we cannot push aside the Bible message of holiness because it's given by God so that we will have our lives turned around, affected, changed, brought in line with the holiness message of the Bible and thereafter discover the very secret, deep secret, hidden secret of spiritual power, spiritual life. And in this message of the highway of holiness, I'll be talking on just three points. Number one, the search. Number two, the screening. Number three, the safety. The search, the screening, the safety. The search, the search for the old path. The screening, the screening of the passengers. The safety, the safety in the pathway. Search for the old path. Screening of the passengers. And the safety in the pathway. As Isaiah said, this great mighty prophet of God, there is a highway of holiness. As Jesus has told us, there is a narrow way leading unto life eternal. And as Paul has spoken about it, there is the necessity of walking in the Spirit. But brothers and sisters, I need to tell you with great emphasis... Because the days in which we lay are perilous days, dangerous days, difficult days. These are days where it is, when it is difficult, very, very difficult to have the truth, to be exposed to the truth, and to discover the highway of holiness, the old path of Bible ways, and to walk therein. That's why we're told in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth, purchase the truth, get the truth, possess the truth, and make sure you never lose it. Make sure you never, you never sell it out. Brothers and sisters, there are many things in life, in the life in which we live, the life we live today, that will contain every inch of the way. Contain against what you are receiving. That will try to take away from you the precious thing, the indispensable thing, the thing that will take you to heaven. There are many things in life that will contest every inch of the way. As if you should not make any spiritual progress. That's why you are counseled, you are instructed, you are commanded. Buy the truth, possess the truth, purchase the truth, and make sure you never lose it. Because the tendency to lose it will be there. The attractions of the world to make you lose it will be there. And the offenses of the gospel 
to tempt you to lose it will be there, but buy it and keep it. Never lose it. The search for the old past in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, every time I read that in the Bible, in these days, I rejoice. Because you still have a Bible. And you still have the word of the Lord saying, I want to speak to you. My children, thus says the Lord. In many religious circles today, the Lord is no more talking to them. All they now tell us is, according to Professor so-and-so, Professor of Theology, according to Doctor so-and-so, Doctor of Divinity, now all they now hang their faith upon, all they hang their confidence upon, will be the Doctors of Divinity and the Professors of Theology. But thank God, thank God, when somebody can rise up and say, Thus says the Lord. And Jeremiah, looking at the whole nation, knowing that the whole nation was being swayed aside, going astray, he said, The Lord is speaking to you. Thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. What a great instruction. That is not everything that goes by the name of religious activity. That should arrest your attention. Possibly in your community. Possibly on your street. Possibly all around you. There will be people going up and down with religious activities. But the Lord says unto you, watch and see. And be able to search, be able to detect the good way of the Lord. Because it's not everything that is done in the name of Jesus that is acceptable to Christ. It is not everything that has the name of God that is acceptable to God. You stand and see and ask for the old paths and ask where is the good way because the ancient way is the good way the old path is the good way there are many contemporary thoughts there are people that will present modern lifestyle new morality but the Lord is saying just check up for the way that is as old as the Bible. When you have discovered it in your search, walk therein. And I praise God because of the testimonies I've heard from a lot of people here that will say they've attended many, many churches, but they seem not to be satisfied. They were looking for something they had not got. Eventually they came to this place, the Lord directed them, a friend invited them, a neighbor brought them along, a parent took them along, or a child introduced the thing to them as parents, and the moment they came, the Spirit of the Lord registered in their hearts, that's what we've been looking for. That's what we've been looking for. And I've heard that testimony over and over and over again. And for those in that category, I praise the Lord for you. I pray that this thing that you have got, you'll never lose it in Jesus' name. For those who are still searching, for those who have not arrived, for those who have not held on to the old way, the old path, the way of the Lord, here you are told, stand and see and ask, which is the old way? And the moment you discover it like you are discovering it, this afternoon, walk therein. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 15. Because my people have forgotten me. They have burnt incense to vanity. They have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths. To walk in paths in a way not cast off. You can see, so to say, 
the sorrow, the anguish, the grief, in the heart of our Father God in heaven. Because these people left the old path, the ancient path. The Lord is calling us that what He wants us to do today is to discover the old path and walk therein. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. God was telling the children of Israel that if they will find out the ancient path, the way of the Lord, in a place where they will not stumble, then he will own them as children, he will be a father to them. And he says, Then will Israel be my son, if pray my firstborn. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, from verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in their heart, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The Lord here divided society into two. On one side, few people. On the other side, many, many, many people. Almost uncomfortable. And he said, if you are looking for the truth, if you are looking for the way to life, if we are looking for the way to get into eternal kingdom of God, you are not going to find the way among those multitudes of religious people. But you find the faithful few. You find the people that have told the Lord, Oh Lord, the most important thing to me on the face of the earth is to have peace with my God and a place in heaven when I die. And those people are few. And Jesus said that there is a broad gate. It takes everybody. It takes everything. And then there is a broad way. And the people that walk in there, they are law unto themselves. They do not have any other law guiding them. The law of their belly, the law of their mind, the law of their brain, the law of their nation, but not the law of the Bible. They are just a law unto themselves. But then he says, there is a straight gauge, very small, so small in those days, that when those camels were coming from a neighboring village, carrying some merchandise and carrying some goodies from that village and wanted to get into this village, and the broad gate had been closed because it was getting to night, this camel to get through the straight gauge, will have to bend low. Then you have to remove all the load on the back of that camel before it will crawl through. And Jesus used that picture that the gauge into the road that leads unto eternal life is so very small, so very low that everyone that comes in will have to bend low, bow low, and be humble and just crawl through. Because we cannot enter into that straight and narrow way with all our sins. We have to drop everything at that gate. Be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said, that gate be straight, very small. That way be narrow. The way that leads to life eternal. Many, many people have never discovered that way. Only few there be that find that way. And if you are among those few, I praise the Lord for you. But keep on to it. Hold on to it. Because that's the good way. Now, the screening of a passenger going to heaven, 
It's not just that we go from the house to the church, from the church to heaven. No. There is a screening going on. Because the Lord himself has told us in the passage I read to you in Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And an highway shall be there. And a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. There is a screening going on. That the Lord will be watching. And for the people that have no desire to, to clean up their lives. No desire to have a change. No desire to have a transformation of life. And they want to remain unclean. Remain dirty. Remain defiled. Remain sinful. And yet get to heaven. The screening process will disqualify them. Because the unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, though ignorant by worldly standard, they shall not err therein. Now let me talk more about this screening of the passengers. In Isaiah chapter 52, verses 1 and 2 and 11. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. The uncircumcised and the unclean. The screening process will disqualify those with circumcised, hard, stony hearts. The screening process will disqualify those with unclean, Defiled, polluted habits, attitudes, actions, lives. Then it says in verse 2, Shake thyself from the doors. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from thy bands, from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Look at verse 11. Depart ye. Depart ye. Go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean sin. Go ye out from the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Have you heard before? That if you are going on your way to heaven, right into the presence of God, right into that close intimacy and union and fellowship with the Lord, that you have to come out of that gambling gang. Because you cannot remain in that gambling and still make it into the very presence of God. You have to come out of that house of prostitution. If you want to be in the very presence of God, because it says, depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence. The company, the group of drunkards that you've been following, if you have been following them, if you have been together, the word of the Lord is saying, you want to discover the old path leading straight unto heaven, depart ye, come out of that gang, the gang of robbers, the gang of evildoers, the gang of smokers, the gang, the gang of workers of iniquity, the gang of those who are living in sin. Who are rejoicing in their iniquity. Their shame is their glory. The Bible is saying, if you want to make it right into the presence of God now and uh, in eternal life, depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Know what that means? For the children of Israel, touch no unclean thing. They will be thinking about not touching a dead body. They'll be thinking of not touching an animal that died on its soul. They'll be thinking of not touching an unclean animal. But for you today, in the gospel dispensation, for you today, in the church of God, for you today, as a child of God, washed in the blood, getting ready, that when the Lord will come, you'll go with Him. Do you know what it means? Touch no unclean thing. It means, don't touch your neighbor's wife. Because adultery makes you unclean. It means don't touch your neighbor's daughter, your neighbor's sister, that person that has not got married. Leave her alone if she is not your wife. 
Don't get into immorality. And you know, boys and girls at school, your colleagues, your fellow students will be telling you, even some of your teachers will be telling you that to be a nice guy, tough boy, and to be a fashionable girl and lady as a secondary school girl, that you must have boyfriend, girlfriend. But you know, this is the prophet of God, Isaiah, sent by God. Because that man, Isaiah, must have been greater than your teacher, your principal, anybody misleading you. Because this is the person that prophesied about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Behold, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Now, this is a person that heard from the Lord directly. And it says, boys and girls, touch no unclean thing. That dirty thing they call boyfriend, girlfriend at school, leave it alone. You want to serve the Lord? And that's why you are coming every Sunday. Leave that thing alone. The smoking, the drinking, those pranks that those little children have started playing at school. Leave all those sins alone. The word of God says, touch no unclean sin. And uh, you adults, it's saying, get rid of that sin that is called immorality. Anything that is evil, anything that will defile, pollute your conscience. Touch no unclean sin. Go ye out from the midst of her. Be ye clean, that they are the vessels of the Lord. In the New Testament, in Second Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You know, that's a beautiful thought. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You know, brothers and sisters, Discover the old path and walk in this old way. Listen to me. I travel around. I see a lot of things going on in this city and in this country. But hold on to what God has given you. You'll find there will be preachers, preachers of the gospel, Invited, not to this church, but to some of these other preaching points outside. And they will come in there, and they will come with another person's wife. And they will be preaching. And it is possible, after they are preaching, they will be saying, they are going to cast out devils, they are going to heal the sick. And when you see that, in your mind, if you forget about heaven, if you forget what you have been hearing, if you forget the highway of holiness, you will say, there is it now, look at this evangelist, this great, great man of God. And we know that obviously this is not his wife. And see him so free with another person's wife. And he's still preaching and many things are happening. The Lord knows them that are his. Jesus himself said, many will come unto me in the last day. And they will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And in your name we have done many wonderful works. And Jesus will look at them straight in the face and reply them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes we'll be tempted coming to a church like this. That in this church we teach you on the highway of holiness, touch no unclean thing, live right, and then you will see other people that say they are Christians, they are free. They tell jokes and lie. They dress in such a way that you'll think they are contesting for Miss Nigeria. And they will they will cheat and they will say they are born again. And you say, why are we like this? They are born again, we are born again, and we are just suffering. Ah, my brother, my sister, God knows them that are his. You'll find in other places that he'll tell them, 
that as long as you are born again, you are on your way to heaven, doesn't matter how many wives you marry. And then you come to the church here. And then we teach you the word of the Lord. One man, one woman. And you say, well, all these things that we're hearing, after all, are there not Christians outside there? And day two they are born again? And day two they are moving on with the Lord? And they marry many wives? My brother, my sister, the last day will show who is a Christian. As at now, they look at us and they pity us. And they say, they don't enjoy life, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't carry on with other people's wives. But they are saying that they are also going to heaven. And they are saying, we will be surprised when we see them in heaven. They will be surprised when they don't find themselves in heaven. Because the standard is high. That the Lord knows them that are A's. My brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. It may shock you. I have seen people that speak in tongues and smoke. I've seen people that speak in tongues and they drink. Drink beer. To any level. I've seen people that are speaking in tongues and they will still take Mary as the as the mother of God and still say that Mary will take them to heaven. I've seen people that speak in tongues and will go for mass. I have seen people that will speak in tongues and yet they will still believe erroneous things. But don't let the charismatic things fool you. The Lord knows them that are ease. You'll find groups of people all over the city. You'll find people meeting together in a hotel somewhere, meeting together in a church building somewhere, and you know, they carry on and dance in the spirit and speak in tongues and fall down. They say they are slain under the spirit, and after that they can get up and fight, get up and quarrel, get up and get angry. Brother, just wait where you are. You have heard the word of the Lord. Keep on to that truth. Don't sell it. Don't give it all. Because it says, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There is a screening process going on. And the Lord wants you to just keep straight with the word of, word of God. Don't let anybody tell you, well, it doesn't matter how we live. doesn't matter what we do. Well... That may look nice preaching to those who don't want to have an intimate relationship with God, but that's an error. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man but God, who has also given us of his Holy Spirit. Now it says, the unclean shall not pass over that way. What makes a man unclean? Let the Bible answer. In Mark chapter 7, from verse 20, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, makes the man unclean. What are they? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, abortion included, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things without exception come from within and defile the man. In short, sin will make a man or a woman unclean, unfit for walking in the highway of holiness. Now there are open sins, flagrant sins. Then there are covered, hidden, inward sins. What are the open sins? Those flagrant sins. The sins that everybody, well, when you hear, you say, well, that must be a sin truly. 
Look at First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, now, the abusers of themselves was mankind. Who are those people? The effeminate. I'm sure sometimes we've seen some of these uh, boys that will bleach their faces, palm their hair, that will look sissy, that will look uh, sheepish, that will look like they have jellyfish, uh, jellyfish for a back bowl, that actually they are not men. In looking at their anatomy, they appear to be men. But looking at their composition, they appear to be another thing. Soft. And then they will be dressing in the women's garb. That is, in the women's dress, women's attire. That's their feminine. And sometimes you'll find some of these people, they think they're trying to just be modern. They have earrings on, on one ear, and it's a man. That's sissy. That's a feminine. And it says, abusers of themselves was mankind. Now these are people that are involved with homosexuality. Men with men doing that which is evil. And you know, that's a terrible sin. That's a great sin. That was a sin that wiped out the whole of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 10, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. These are open sins. And the Lord is saying, get rid of them. Before you can be born again, you come to the Lord saying, O oh Lord, forgive me. Of all these open sins, flagrant sins, just take them out of my life. And the moment you have truly repented, turned away from all those sins, you are born again. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you to take away all those sins, suddenly you have the peace of God, the joy of salvation. And the Spirit of God begins to witness within you that you are now a child of God. But then, after that, you are now born again. You are now saved. Is there any other thing that we need? Let's talk about it this way. If you have been born again, let me ask you some questions. Have you discovered that after you became free from the outward, external, open sins, you discovered within you sometimes resentment coming up out of your heart. And you suddenly realized that you have not got yet the mind of Christ. Because of that resentment against husband, against wife, against a neighbor, against your boss, you have seen that your heart has not been full of love. Have you discovered sometimes that even though you are born again, and by the grace of God, you are free from all the outward external sins, but then you find that when you see a particular individual appearing, coming, there is irritability coming out of your heart. In what? Silent, hidden, not known to anybody, but you know it. That in your heart grows up that tendency for irritation. Have you ever discovered you are born again, you are a child of God, that you are quick to criticism, quick, quick to criticize, that somebody has done something, you are always an imperfect person judging other people who are not perfect, and you are always saying that's not good. Have you ever discovered that? Have you ever discovered that you are touchy? You are saved, you are born again, you are a child of God, praise God, adultery is gone. Praise God, all these other sins I talked to you about, they are all gone. Idol worshipping, everything gone. Thank God, whenever you look up, you say, Abba, Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. Anytime you look up to God, you say, you, you are my Father. And the Lord is my Savior, yet within you. Have you noticed that there is that bit of touchiness? 
that sensitiveness. Not, you are not happy with it yourself. You appear to be wearing your nerves on your skin. And somebody does something very small, you are, you are touchy, you are irritated, you are sensitive. Apart from that, do you find that you are a believer? But a little thing that happens, you grumble. A little delay at the bus stop, you grumble. A little adjustment of where to sit and where not to sit in the church, you grumble. The food is late a little at home, you get not fighting, not quarreling, not really totally angry, but you grumble. Have you discovered that? Have you discovered that you are given to suspicion? You suspect almost everybody around you. Suspect your wife, you are born again. Your sins, you have said, oh Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, change my life. And you have given testimony. And even your neighbors and your friends, they have said, ah, if Mr. So-and-so can change like this, God is powerful. And yet within you, hidden, covered, away from the sight of people, you have discovered that there is this suspicion of all people around you. If uh, two people are talking together, you think they are talking about you. If people are laughing all the time, you'll be saying, they must be laughing about me. Have you discovered that? How about duplicity? Not direct deceit, but dealing with people, with what you have called diplomacy. But really it's duplicity. You are unreal. You laugh, but the laughter sometimes, many times, just plastic. Just put on. Right deep within you, your mind is going this way, but your laughter is going this other direction. That's being unreal. That's pretend. Isn't that hypocrisy? Isn't that what we call window dressing? Have you found in you bossiness? Woman, you are born again. But that maid in the house, many times will be wondering, ah, uh -uh, mommy said that she is born again, now she is going to this deeper life. And yet, I'm so miserable in the house under her. Like Hagar was miserable under Sarah. Why, is this, why are things like this? Have you discovered that even on your children, they said, yes, mommy is born again because... Those uh, men don't come to our house anymore whenever daddy is out of town. Mommy has changed because um, she doesn't send us with letters anymore now to those men outside. Mommy has changed. She doesn't drink anymore. She doesn't smoke anymore. And she doesn't uh, do this and do that anymore. But why is it that mommy didn't change totally? Because mommy is so bossy and will clamp down on everybody. I'm a very, very authoritative and instill fear into the hearts of innocent people. Why? Didn't mommy have a total change? Children, you won't understand. It's because mommy needs a second operation of the hand of the Almighty God that is called sanctification. You know, you are born again. All these outward sins have been taken away. But then you have discovered in yourself that even though you are born again, even though you are living a new life, even though you are having your quiet time every day, even though you are praying every day, even though you can say, praise the Lord, I am not what I used to be, but the resentment, the irritability, the criticism, very quick coming from your mouth, the touchiness and the sensitiveness, the grumbling and the suspicion of all people around you, the duplicity, being unreal, Pretense, hypocrisy, window dressing, a bossiness, and then the impure thoughts. Man, have you discovered that? Born again? But you can't see a lady pass. You'll forget about your business, you'll forget about your Bible, you'll forget about the church, you'll forget about everything in life because of that lady that passed. And for the next few minutes or hours or days, it's just that you'll be thinking about what's that? As holiness, as purity, 
That's heavenly character. No. That's what we're talking about. And there's a screening process going on of the passengers that want to tread on the path on the highway of holiness. And if all these things are there, hidden deep within the heart, how about cherishing wrong thoughts against other people? That thing that we have talked about since last year, and you are still nursing it like a baby. You are still cherishing it as if it's something that needs a tender care, the wrong feeling. Take it out of the way. That's what we are talking about. That after we are saved, there is the necessity to present the same heart to the Lord and say, Lord, sanctify me. Take all these things away. Have you ever seen impatience in you? You like other people to be patient with you, but you are never patient with anybody. Not with your husband, not with your wife, not with your children, not with your maid, not with your neighbor, not with even church members. How about that? Have you noticed envy and jealousy before in your heart? That person has got something that you have not got. Have you ever felt envious? I'm talking about after being born again. Have you ever felt jealous after being born again? That person has maybe sometimes something that is natural. That God has just endowed that person with. Maybe the body physique. Maybe the posture. Maybe a property, piece of property. Maybe a highly uh, privileged position. And you are jealous. That's wrong. Have you ever found talkativeness in you? That you will just talk. And talk and talk. And whenever there is not a chance to talk, you feel miserable. Think about it. And all that you are talking about, there are things that are worthless and useless. There are things that do not contribute anything positive to your life or any other person's life. You know, that's what we are talking about. That after you have been saved, that you will go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I have discovered some things internally. I'm all right outwardly, I'm all right externally, but inwardly, help me, cleanse me, purge me, purify me. That's what the Bible calls sanctification. Then there are people, I'm sure you, you might, if you are not sanctified, you would have discovered this before, self-centeredness. Self-centeredness has, uh, you know, many, many areas. Number one, it has the area of self-defense. Whenever you are corrected, you have done something wrong. But every time you are corrected, you always defend yourself. A self-centeredness. And if you have discovered that, you bring it to the foot of the cross. And there is self-consciousness. Whenever you are called to take a humble seat, you suddenly realize that there's something within you that hates it, rejects it, aggressively opposes it. But you know, that is just self-consciousness, a branch of self-centeredness. Or you are called to a promoted position, a high position, and you find within you an attitude as if you are better than everybody else, and actually it's, that's not so. Because all you have, you do not merit from the hand of the law. Then there is self-indulgence in the use of the things of this world. Even things that are legitimate. Things that are legitimate. You are a Christian, you are born again. Yet, you can eat and eat until... You know you are becoming inconvenienced, but because of self-indulgence, we just go on. And you'll drink. I'm not talking of drinking beer. Because now you are born again. But even the legitimate things that you drink, that you can drink and drink and drink and um, you, are, you are already full. But somebody says, will you take this one? You say, well, every time I see that thing, maybe Maltex. Maybe just a Fanta, maybe just even ordinary Coke, maybe just something, just something legitimate. I'll say, every time I see that thing, I don't know how to say no. That's self-indulgence. Get, get rid of it. That's self-indulgence. And it is part of self-centeredness. 
legitimate things. Have you ever noticed self-pity? When you are hurt, when you are injured, you pity yourself. You lock up the door and you cry and cry and weep and adult. And it's all because of self-pity. Others, self-seeking. Whenever there are vacancies to be filled, they just uh, seek a position for themselves, even in the church. Then, excuse-making. Excusing self and blaming others whenever anything goes wrong. How about the fear of the future, even in God's house, even in God's presence, even in the family of God? That, well, I'm afraid of the future. I do not want to get into that church and work for the Lord because I'm afraid of how they will treat me. That self-consciousness coming up again. That self-centeredness coming up again. I don't want to be disappointed again. That's it again. Self-centeredness still coming in. And you know, all these things can be cleansed by the word of God and can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, that he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the world, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. And many people that will argue with us on sanctification. And they say they don't believe that it's necessary to go to God again and be cleansed and be purified and be sanctified. Then we ask them, have you found that after you are born again, the resentment is still there? Irritability is still there? Being touchy is still there? Criticism is still there? Grumbling, suspicion for all, of all people still there after you are born again? Have you found that sometimes you are unreal, you pretend, even after you are born again? Have you found being bossy, extremely, extraordinarily, carnally, authoritative on people? Have you found that? Have you found impure thoughts? Just stealing in, and it's not just something that passes, it's something that you, you cherish. In your heart, have you found that before? Have you found that you're cherishing um, wrong thoughts, wrong feelings against other people? Now, if all those things are there, is the church glorious with all those things? Of course, no. Is the Christian glorious with all those things in the heart and in the life? Of course, no. That's why Jesus Christ is expecting you back. You have visited Calvary once, come the second time. Come the second time and tell the Lord, I know that you are building a church that will be glorious, a church without blemish, a church without wrinkle, a church without spot. And I've come back. I came before to Calvary. I came as a sinner. I came wanting redemption for my soul. I came wanting salvation for myself. I came wanting forgiveness. I came wanting a place in heaven. I came wanting the hand of the Lord to just take me and grab me and turn me around and just get me ready so that I can start the Christian journey. But now I come again. The second time. The second definite work of grace. Sanctification. Holiness. Purity. I come so that all these aberrations, all these inner attitudes, all these things that are wrong will be taken out of my heart. And you'll give me a new heart. Purged, cleansed, sanctified, purified. And so it says in verse 27, that he might present age unto himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's why we're talking about all these things. So that we can present ourselves before the Lord and get this definite experience from the Lord. Now let's go to safety in the pathway. In Isaiah chapter 35, and I'm reading from verse 8 again. And an highway shall be there, and a way, 
and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, that road is safe. That road is safe. There are only few on that road. The devil is not on that road. The lion that will crush, the lion that will devour, kill, destroy, is not there. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed of the Lord shall walk there. You know my desire for you? My prayer for you is that you'll get on this highway of holiness and you'll walk in it in Jesus' name. And all the strength you need, all the power you need, all the cleansing you need, every type of quality, spiritual quality you need to make you walk in the highway of holiness and not stumble and not fall, I pray God will give unto you in Jesus' name. You know, it says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. And come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sign shall flee away. I pray it will be so. I pray that will be your experience. It's available with the Lord. The Lord is saying, come unto me. Come unto me. You're weary. You're heavy lady. You're saying, I don't understand. I've been saved. I've given my life to the Lord. I've even been leading other people, saying, Come along. The Lord is so sweet, but I'm weary of my life. Like Jacob said, I'm weary of my life because of the resentment, because of the touchiness, because of the sensitiveness, because of the impure things that are crossing my mind all the time, arresting my attention. I'm weary because of all these hidden, inner, internal, inward things. And the Lord is saying, if you're weary, I'm waiting for you. Here is the blood shed for every form of uncleanness. And the Lord, according to his promise in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. The grace is in the hand of the Lord. He can make you clean from all those inner, inward things, hidden things. From all your filthiness. Would you know that all these things I've been talking about? Those things that are in the inner life. They're filthy before God. And it says, from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you an heart of flesh. He can do it this afternoon. You believe it? If you believe it, rise up and talk to the Lord about it. Say, Lord, thank you for saving me. But Lord, I come the second time. And I want that work of grace to be done in me. You tell the Lord and he will do it. Rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. And say, Lord, do it for me. Lord, do it for me. Lord, do it for me. And he will do it. He has been waiting for you to call upon him. He has been waiting for you to ask him. He will cleanse. He will purify. He will sanctify. And he'll put your feet on the highway of holiness. And there'll be safety on that road. He'll do it. Until he makes you glorious internally, giving you the mind of Christ. Giving you a new, very new heart. And all those evil things, inner attributes that are wrong. He'll take everything away. He'll take everything away. He'll do it for you. Let's call upon the Lord and He will bless us.
He will bless us. Call upon the Lord. This is the way to eternal life. This is the highway of holiness. He'll do it if you call upon Him. He will do it if you call upon Him. 